How many of you has that baby changed everything in your life? <laughs> yeah, glory to God. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. That's what a baby can do in your life. Not a baby, but the baby, right? Yeah, the baby. And God sent his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have life everlasting. And that's a, a, simple, a simple task, right? And whosoever should believe in him should not perish, but have life everlasting. What a, what a marvelously simplistic uh, response we have to receive that which God has put before us and what God expects from us in order to be saved. Everybody say, the grace of God. That's simply all it is, and I know that that word, the grace of God, we've heard it so often that a lot of times, you know, we, when we look at it, we, we just kind of simply pass by that word grace because we've heard it so often that we really don't think about what actually the grace of God really is. And I think it's important, and I, I, a matter of fact, I was talking with Pastor Tanya this week as I was building this message, and like I always do, and we talk about different aspects of things. And, and it was, I was almost trying to say to myself, Lord, why, why would you be inspiring this uh, message about the grace of God? Because everybody's, you know, we've all as dynamic believers and many of us, most of us in here, Christians, we've received the Lord, we've received the grace of God. Many of you have been in church all your life and you've heard about the grace of God and you have a good grasp on what the grace of God is. I'm thinking, Lord, what, 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 would, this pur what would the purpose of something like this be? And, and, and I believe that I heard from the Lord in my heart, in my spirit, and my mind, you know, how God speaks to you and how God leads you in your thoughts and all of that. And, and toward the fact that we have an enemy of our soul and an enemy of the kingdom of God that is constantly trying to push us away from the God who loves us. And the God who loves us says to us in every presentation of himself, all throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, every time God presents himself, God is convincing us and saying to us, I am your heavenly father. I, 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 am, I, am, I want to be your dad. I want to I I father you through the issues of your life. I don't want you to be afraid of me. I don't want you to be separated from me. I don't want you to look at me like I'm some absentee landlord in heaven with the Ten Commandments in one hand and a bat in the other, just waiting for you to mess up again, you know? Uh, just do it one more time. I am so sick of you, uh, you know? And that's what our enemy would love for us to believe about our Father in heaven so that we would never be close to him. We would never receive him as a loving father, and we would never go to him as a loving father, but we would fear him and reject him and stay away from him as if he's out to get us on every hand. And so it is the grace of God that really explains to us what our relationship with God is all about and I just, uh, or the Lord, I believe in my heart, wants us to just take a little quick jaunt through his word and a few concepts here to see how the glory of God that we sing about, that we talk about, you know, the glory means, the, uh, gl uh, your glory would be the outward manifestation of what is inside of you. That's your glory. Same thing's true with God. When we talk about the glory of God, we're talking about a revelation on the outside of what God is on the inside. That is the term glory. So the glory of God is what God is full of. It is we get to see with our eyes, experience with our hearts, experience with the reality of humanity. We see what God is because what is on the 
inside is reflected by something that is on the outside that allows us to really see God as he is, and that is called the glory of God. And throughout the Bible, God is constantly reflecting his glory. And many passages in the New Testament that we love and that we know by heart, it's all about the glory of God being reflected on this earth by Jesus Christ and the fact that, that all of us see the glory of God through the Son of God that came and reflected the glory of God. And that's why Christianity is separated from all of the other belief systems in the world. Now, I, you know, I don't know every detail about every religion of the world, but I know enough about the ones I do know about to know that uh, there's a great deal of difference between uh, these concepts of, of God in all of these belief systems in the world. And I'm talking about the different big religions and, you know, all these things. Uh, Christianity is different from that. Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is a set of beliefs about a God who is personal, who is loving, and, it has, and is gracious, a God who wants to interact with you, a God who wants to be personal, and a God who wants to help you and bless you and be kind to you and gentle to you and gracious to you. All of the other religions in the world present a God who is angry or controlling or, or uh, uh, desires uh, to, to dominate and control and has all these rules and laws and so forth to, to dominate people on the earth and to rule the world and to, and to have chaos and disaster and anger and hostility and wrath and punishment and judgment. And if you don't do the right thing, just bam, and you're out of here. And then they encourage their followers to have this same mentality in life. Christianity is the only set of beliefs in the world that actually presents a God who is gracious and wants to be a blessing and wants his people to be a blessing. I submit to you that there are no, there's no group of people on this earth that are kinder, more generous, more loving, more forgiving, more gracious, more helpful than true Christians who love the God of heaven that presents himself in the word of God as, as, as a glorious God that is gracious and is full of grace and mercy. And that's what God presents you. And so I'm saying that the glory of God is the grace of God. What is it that reflects what God is on the inside? It's grace. Grace reflects on the outside what God is full of on the inside. So when we see the grace of God, it is actually reflecting the glory of God because that's what God chooses to be known for. Out of all the concepts and all the things that God could be known for, he could be known for his harshness. He could be known for his judgment. He could be known for his fearfulness. He could be known for anything he wanted to put forward. But what God chooses to put forward to say, this is the most important virtue I, I have. This is how I want you to see me. If you can see me like this, it's going to bless you because it's going to encourage you to come to, come to me. It, it's not going to push you away from me. It's going to draw you to me. And I submit to you that that's what we need on this earth. We need to be fathered. We need to be loved. We need to be taken through uh, the rough times and the tough times of life. And, and, and God says, let me do that for you. Let me be your heavenly father. Let me love you. Let me, let me, let me comfort you. Let me uh, encourage you. Let me walk with you. Look, don't be afraid to come to me. You can come to me with anything at any time, in any circumstance, in anything, and you can cry out to me, Daddy, help me. Abba, Father, you know, Papa, walk with me through this. But we're encouraged by our enemy to never see God this way. And I submit to you that you will be no closer to God than your concept of God will allow you to be. In other words, if you look at God as the ogre in heaven with a Ten Commandments in one hand and a baseball bat in the other just waiting to crush you, you're not going to come to a God like that. You're not going to be close to a God like that. You're not going to come to him and let him father you through anything. You're afraid of him. 
You look at him as a mean God that's angry and just ready to crush you rather than a loving father who is ready to bless you and will father you and will do anything, who loves being your father, who loves walking you through. You know, I, I, I have some children of my own, and many of you have children of your own, and you even have grandchildren, which may, you know, you may even have a, a closer relationship with what I'm about to say. I love being a father. I love uh, fathering my children. It, it, they had a need. I loved it when they came and said, Daddy, I got a need. Can you, can you help me with this? And, and man, I love taking my children through those things. I love providing for them. I love making life better for them. I like guiding them through. I love being there and holding their hand or being behind the scenes, making sure they're success. I mean, I love fathering my children. And I'm an evil person. According to God, I mean, compared to God, I'm evil, right? I mean, uh, compared to the greatness and glory of God as a human being, we're all evil by comparison to God. Now, if we compare ourselves to each other, we may not be evil. You know, I may be a little better than you. You may be a little better than me. But when we compare ourselves to God, we would all be considered evil. And all I'm saying by that is, if I desire to father my children with such a great passion and such a great love, and I'm evil, just imagine how much more God, who is wonderful and gracious and majestic and is not evil, wants to father you through the issues of your life. And the only reason he doesn't is because you won't come to him, because you don't look at him that way. You look at him in some way that hinders the fact that you would come to him and allow him to father you through these issues of life. One of the, one, one of the passages of Scripture that everybody knows, almost regardless of whether you're a Christian or not, it, it's probably spoken at every funeral service that any of us have ever been to in our life is Psalm 23. And in Psalm 23... When he gets down there, you know, he leads me beside still waters and restores my soul. And then, he said, and then he says, and yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, <laughs> I will fear no evil. Why? Why, why am I not going to fear any evil? Because my papa's with me. I, my, my daddy's walking with me. The, the reason I'm not afraid of evil is because daddy's walking right there beside me. And his rod and his staff, they bring me comfort. And he prepares a table in the very presence of mine enemy. He anoints my head. My cup runs over. Surely the goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I'll dwell in the house. How can we say that? Well, we say that because we got a papa who's going to walk with us. Remember, that's not through the valley of sunrise or the you know, valley, of a, a valley of a little misstep. No, it's the, it's the valley of the shadow of death. It's the valley of the greatest fear of our life. And God says, don't worry. I'll be right there with you because daddy loves you and I'm going to carry you through. If you'll just come to me, let me do this. Just come on, uh, put, put, jump in my arms. Here I am. And the enemy's saying, he doesn't love you. He doesn't care about you. He's an absentee landlord. He's, a, he's, a, he's an ogre in heaven. He's, a, he's somebody that's sitting way out there, and he just started this thing spinning and then said, all right, do the best you can. And he doesn't, he's not personal. He doesn't want a relationship with you. Don't take anything to him because he really doesn't care. And if you get close enough to him, he's going to judge you. He's just waiting to smash you because you do bad stuff, and he doesn't like bad stuff, and so he's going to smash you the first chance he gets. And so our concept of God affects how close we get to God because not one of us will ever get closer to God than our concept of God will allow us to. So what I'm presenting to you today is that throughout the Word, it is the grace of God that God speaks and says, when you think of me, when you see me, I want you to know that my greatest virtue is grace. I, the first thing I want you to see about me is grace. Now, let me give you to a passage that, that this one we all know a lot about, John chapter 1. 
In John chapter 1, you know, you have the presentation of of, of uh, how the earth was formed and how the earth was made. You remember in the beginning, verse, first verse says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and all things were created by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And then it comes on down to verse 14, and notice, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, Read that next line, full of grace grace and truth. All right, so God's saying so far, uh, when you think of me and you think of my glory, the first thing I want you to think of is that I am full of grace and truth, right? I'm full of both grace and I'm full of truth. I'm not half full of grace, but mostly filled with truth or I'm not half full of truth, and then a little bit more feel, I am full, I'm double full. I'm full of grace, and and I'm full of truth. And John bore witness of him, saying, and cried out, saying, this is he of whom I said, he who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. That's John the Baptist, and he's just saying, okay, I'm telling you about Jesus. And of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, But grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. So John is saying here that we beheld the glory of God as Jesus reflected the glory of God. In other words, the way we see the glory of God is that Jesus reflected it to us here on earth and that it is full of grace and it is full of glory. And notice in the list, whenever the Bible talks about the attributes of God and it talks about the truth of God, it always lists grace first. Grace, when it says he's full of something and truth, it's always he is full of grace. Grace is always presented first. Because God, that's what God wants you to see about him. That he, before he's, I mean, he's full of truth. And there's no doubt that he's full of truth. And he has, he has regulations and laws. And he has those things that he tells us. But the first thing he wants to see about it, that we, he wants us to see about him, is that he is full of grace. In the Old Testament, in Exodus 33. In Exodus 33, you have Moses talking to God. And Moses is saying to God, uh, God, let me see your glory. Let me, let, let me see your face. And you remember what God said to him? God said, okay, Moses, um, I can't let you see my face because no one could stand to see my face because if you saw my full glory, it would annihilate you. It would overwhelm. I mean, it would just blow you up because no one can see my face and live. But I'll tell you what I'll do. He said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put you in the cleft of the rock right over there and I'm going to put my hand over you, and I'm going to pass by you, and when I pass by you, I'm going to move my hand, and I'm going to let you see my hind parts. I'm going to let you see my back. And so that's what exactly what God did. God put Moses over there, and God, and God put his hand over him, and then uh, God passes by, and, then, and, and, and God uh, moves his hand, and Moses gets to see the, the, uh, the, the hind part of God, the goodness of God passes before him. And then in Exodus 34, a couple of verses later, uh, I want you to see the testimony here of what God says that he's about. Because when he passed by Moses, he says, Moses, I'm going to give you seven virtues. There, these seven things is what I am. And he lists all seven of them right here in Exodus 34. Look at verse 5. Now the Lord descended in the cloud... And he stood with him, stood with Moses there, and he proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God. What are the next two words? (laughs) Merciful and gracious. All right, so the first two virtues that God says that he's all about is that he is merciful and gracious. So he's going to give us seven attributes of himself And the first thing he says about himself is that he is merciful and gracious. I submit to you that if if you're going to tell someone about what you are and who you are, 
The thing that you mention first is the thing you want them to remember about you. The thing you say first is, is the thing that you are all about when you introduce yourself to someone. And here's God, and he's speaking to Moses. He said, I want you to know, first of all, that I am merciful and gracious. Here comes the second attribute, long-suffering. Third attribute, abounding in goodness and truth. Fourth, keeping mercy for, for thousands. Fifth, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin. Sixth, by no means clear, clearing, the, clearing the guilty. Seven, visiting the iniquity of the father upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And what I'm saying there is that God gives Moses a view of himself. And God says, what I want to say to you is that I want you to know, first of all, that I'm a God of grace and mercy. Because when I start dealing with you about the law and about the commandments and all that, you're going to be tempted to look at me in a different light. But I want you to know, Moses, that no matter what the law says, no matter what the rules are, no matter how tough it may seem, I want you to know that my greatest virtue and what I want to be made, what I want to be known for is that I'm a God of grace and I'm a God of mercy. That's how I want you to see me. Now, God made a piece of furniture in the Old Testament to represent himself. Let me just ask you, if you couldn't go somewhere, you were going to be absent, you couldn't make it there, and somebody said, all right, I want you to build a piece of furniture that represents you <laughs> and we're going to, when, when, since you can't be there, we're going to let this piece of furniture uh, be you. Uh, what, what, would, what would you do? Well, I'll tell you what God did. What God did is God created a, uh, a box. Matter of fact, uh, let me just make sure. Yeah, here it is. This is a description of what God created to represent himself. In other words, God couldn't be there live and in person. So he said, I'm, I'm going to represent myself in a piece of furniture. And look at what it, what it contains. You shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I'll give you. And there I will meet with you, and I will speak with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are on the ark of testimony, about everything which I will give you in commandment to the children of Israel. So God says, all right, I... I, I, I'm not going to be there, so I'm going to give you a piece of furniture that represents me. And here's the thing that I want you to do. I want you to build a box, and inside that box, you're going to put certain things. And then you're going to take this solid slab of gold, and you're going to put it on top of the ark, and that's going to be called the mercy seat. And the mercy seat means that that's the mercy of God covering whatever's in that box and you got an angel on each end, and those wings are going to be stretching toward each other, and they're going to almost touch, and, and that right there is going to be God. When you look at that, you're going to say, whew, that's God right there. In other words, I'm, I'm not being dealt with by what's on the inside of the box. I'm being dealt with by what's on top of the box, because what's on top of the box has an effect of everything there, and what's on top of the box is the mercy of God. Now, just to show you where the mercy seat came from, and I, I know this might be digging in a little deep, and you may not relate to this, but, but you know, God is so consistent, and it's amazing, and people don't realize the fact that, that everything God does has a purpose, and everything God tells us and Israel and all of the representatives of God throughout the Word of God has a purpose. Do you know when God was giving commands about building this ark and, and this box and this mercy seat and the temple and the tabernacle and all the furnitures and how all the walls and all the curtains and everything about that worship center of the Old Testament that went with Moses and the children of Israel through those 40 years in the desert, that God looked at them and God said, now build it exactly like I say to you. Don't, don't err one iota. Build it the exact length, the exact height, use the material. I, I mean, don't err from this one iota. The reason why is because what they were building on earth was a replica of what was built already in heaven. And in the book of Revelation, in chapter 11, look at what it says about the ark in Revelation. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple, and there were lightnings and noises and thunders and earthquakes and, 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 and hail and so forth. So what, what I'm saying is the reason God had Moses build an ark on this earth by which the children of Israel could see God 
the mercy of God is because it was the exact replica of the ark that, uh, that is in heaven right now in God's temple in heaven. And in Hebrews 9, the Bible says that when Jesus left this earth, that Jesus passed into heaven and says that he took his blood and he sprinkled it on the mercy seat of God in heaven. And when he sprinkled it on the mercy seat, it, it washed our sins away. And once and for all, we were made clean before God. And no more bulls, no more goats, no more pigeons, no more turtle doves, no, no, more, no more sacrifices had to be made. This right here is a picture of the Ark of the Covenant. You see it there? Yeah, a box covered in gold. By the way, the word Ark, I know you're thinking of another Ark. You're thinking about Noah's Ark, right? Noah's Ark was a big boat, right? So we have the tendency to think, okay, the word ark means boat. No, the word ark means a box for safekeeping. In other words, Noah's boat was an ark because it was a box for safekeeping. Noah's ark kept eight people alive. Why? So that they could repopulate this earth. So Noah's boat was an ark, and this is an ark. This is an ark that is filled with the Ten Commandments that were broken, you remember when Moses came down off the mountain, the children of Israel were having a party, dancing around a, a pagan calf that Aaron built, a golden calf. And when Moses saw it, he, throw, he threw the commandments down that had been written with God, and they shattered into pieces. And, Mo, and they collected them back up, and God said, all right, take that broken law and put it inside that box. Now, you'll notice that the box doesn't have any windows in it, you can't see the broken law on the inside, but it's in there. What else is in there? Well, Aaron, the high priest, had a walking stick called a rod, and it budded with almond blossoms and buds and fruit all at the same time that proved that God wanted him to be the high priest. Well, that was in there. And then God said, take a golden pot and fill it with manna because that's how you were kept alive in the wilderness, and let's put that on the inside of there. And then take the mercy seat. You see this giant slab? It's about a three-and-a-half-inch slab of solid gold, and it fits on top of the Ark of the Covenant, and it is called the mercy seat, and it has a two cherubim angels, one on each end. By the way, cherub, the cherubim angels were the angels that were left in the Garden of Eden to guard and make sure Adam and Eve couldn't come back into the Garden of Eden and eat of the tree of life and live forever in their sinful condition. But anyway, the point is, God says, when you look at this piece of furniture, I don't want you to see the broken law. I don't want you to see, I don't want, to, I don't want you to see any of, the, any of the judgment or any of the harshness or any of the rules or restrictions. The first thing I want you to see about me is I want you to see my grace because in order to keep walking with me, you're going to have to see me as a gracious God. So why does grace always go first? Why does God want us to see as a gracious God? Remember, I said to you that you'll get no closer to God than your concept of God will allow you to get. So God wants you to get close to him. God wants you to not be afraid of him, to not fear him, but to love him and to move to him and be close to him. So why does grace go first? Let me give you about three or four reasons here, all right? Number one, grace always goes first because it makes God desirable and approachable. Every time, God, every, every time God presents himself, he presents himself as gracious first because without grace, God is not desirable or approachable. Without grace, God is intimidating. Without grace, God's frightening. <laughs> yeah, God, I mean, does the word crispy critter mean anything to you? Uh, French fry? <laughs> yeah, I mean, without, without grace... Uh, God's a frightening figure and no one would desire to be around him because his judgment is so quick and he's so powerful and he could do anything. So God says, the first thing I want you to see is my grace because you need to see me as approachable and desirable. Look at Hebrews chapter four. We've, I've quoted this a bunch of times, but look at what it says. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Our confession of what? Our confession that we do have a great high priest. Our confession that he is better than anything in the world. That's our confession. Hold fast to that, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. 
Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So God says, I want you to know that I'm a God of grace and I want you to know that my throne is a throne of grace. Many, many of you have heard my testimony about how I grew up in, in my life and I didn't grow up in a Christian home and I didn't grow up going to church. That There was nobody in my family that was a Christian and that I was, one of the, I was the first one in my family to start going to church in any way. Well, you may not know this because I don't really talk about it very often, but as a, as a young teenager, I had some friends that went to church and many times they would invite me to go to church with them. Well, when I would go to church with them, obviously, uh, I was a young teenager. I was lost. I didn't know anything about the Lord. Remember, I didn't have any concept about God. Nobody in my family knew anything about God. I didn't know who God was. I believed in God. I believed that there was a God. I believed that he had a son named Jesus and that Jesus died. And I believed those things, although I didn't know why, but I, I, did, I, I didn't have any trouble believing that. But I didn't know God at all, didn't know how to relate to God, didn't know what God expected from me, didn't know how to be saved, never heard of what I needed to do or anything. And I would go to these churches, and I remember one specific church. I went with uh, some friends, and, and it was a church that was probably about 75 people roughly or so. And, and, and when, so when we walked in, you know, obviously in a church that's a, a fairly small church with 75 people, they're going to notice that you're somebody new, right? And I'm a teenager and I'm somebody new. And I don't know whether the pastor thought, okay, we got a little teenage guy in here and I need to make sure that he knows what we believe and straighten him out. And then I need to preach something hard or difficult. I have no idea what was in his mind, but all I do know is what he began to preach. When he began to preach, he preached for about 45 minutes. Uh, which is a man after my own heart. I have no, no problem with that. But what he did is when he started preaching, he just started yelling. And he yelled for about 45 minutes. And he yelled stuff like, we don't go to movies because movies are of the devil. <laughs> you know? I'm going, check movies of the devil. <laughs> we don't watch TV because TV is of the devil. Oh, check TV. You probably, I thought to myself, you probably need to watch a little TV because it probably, it could, it could help your personality a lot. Yeah, right. <laughs> you need to watch some, some, some aggressive shows to take some of that, some of that aggression out of you. Uh, we don't listen to the devil's music because the devil's music affects our life. And I go, ooh, check. And, and everything he was preaching against, I'm thinking, I, I, I pretty much kind of like, like that, you know. And, and we don't drink alcohol. And, and anyway, the, the whole message was basically a message about, about what they don't do. And, and here's the kicker. Every time he would say something, I had the di distinct impression that everybody in the church was looking at me. Now, they weren't looking straight at me. One like when he said, we don't listen to the devil's music. It wasn't like they went. You know? <laughs> you, 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 have you ever been side-eyed? Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Why side-eyed? You know, you're sitting there, and you just know that they're looking out of the side of their eye. <laughs> I felt like, okay, everybody was trying to see how I'm going to respond to what, what this guy's saying. And he went on for about 45 minutes. And, and here are the two thoughts I had on my way home. And I, I'm just trying to be honest with you now. Remember, I'm, I'm like, like four, 15 years old. I don't know the Lord. I don't know what it means to be a Christian. I don't know how to be a Christian. I'm just searching for God. I'm sure the Holy Spirit was leading me. But these are the two thoughts that I had on, when we left that church. Number one, I was thinking, is, is, is that uh, God? Is what he said today in that message, is that God? I mean, is, is God like that? And then number two, and I'm just being honest about it, if that's what Christianity is, then I don't want anything to do with it. Who wants, to, who wants to be in something like that? Who wants to be in constant, uh, uh, constant scrutiny of, of all of the stuff that you're not supposed to do in life? It, it, who wants to be defined by what you aren't and held to a standard of, uh, of, of what everybody else expects? And you know what? What I found about churches, 
all, that was backed up by lots of churches. Lots of churches preach that kind of message. Messages of what we don't do, what we're not about, what we're full of. Look at, look at uh, John 13. A new commandment I give to you that you, what? That you judge one another, that you uh, get the truth right, that you make sure everybody holds to a stand. No, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this will, 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 by, by this all will know that you are my disciples if you make sure you get all the rules right. By this, <laughs> will, will all men know that you're my disciples if you don't do things that are wrong? That you make sure everybody obeys everything about the law? No, what, what did Jesus say? This, the, the, by this, all men are going to know that you are my disciples. What? Because you love one another. Not because you're mean and, uh, you know, the, the word... Christian and me, a mean Christian would be like an oxymoron. There's no such thing as that. God said, you're going to be known because of the fact that you love. And the thing I want you to know about me is that I am graceful and I am full of truth. But the first thing is I want you to know that I am graceful and I'm not looking to judge you so that when people come, they can be drawn to me. What is the second thing that God wants? Why does, why does grace go first? Num number two, because it makes truth bearable. It makes God desirable and it makes God approachable. And number two, it makes truth bearable. God says, I'll speak to you from the mercy seat. In Exodus 25, you know, he said, I'm going to speak to you from above the mercy seat. And, and so... Uh, the love of God makes things bearable. Truth without grace, I was saying this to Pastor Tanya the other day, I said truth without grace is mean. But grace without truth is meaningless. Grace and truth are like medicine. Grace always comes before truth. Why? Grace is like an anesthesia before the surgery. You know, grace kind of grace kind of takes the edge off. Grace comes first, and then truth can come by, by, uh, behind grace. Let me give you an example of this in Jesus' life. In John chapter John chapter eight, there was uh, Jesus was having a meeting in the with the Pharisees, and all of a sudden they bring to him a woman and says to Jesus, uh, "Hey, Jesus, this woman was caught in the very act of adultery, and you know our law says that she ought to be stoned to death." And so here she is. Well, what are we going to do with her? And Jesus acted like he really didn't hear what they said. He just bent down and he began to doodle on the ground. And as he doodled on the ground, uh, it doesn't say what he was writing, but it does say that as he was doodling on the ground, that the people who were standing around, the Pharisees and the other teachers of the law and all that, that they began to see whatever he was doodling around on on the ground had an effect on them because they all began to just kind of <laughs> walk away. Now, if you ask me what he was doodling on the ground, I, my best guess would be that he was writing some personal stuff. I mean, and he was writing personal stuff that, about them, like uh, uh, your girlfriend is Mary, and then drawing over here this arrow to that <laughs> Pharisee standing right there. And when that Pharisee saw it, he said, whoop Let's go on. <laughs> but as he began to doodle, he, he said to him, he said, all right, the law says, the law, the truth says, the law says what we do with people who commit adultery is we stone them to death. So that's the truth. But he said, what I'm going to say to you is let the one of you who doesn't have any sin, let's let him cast the first stone. Step right up. All right, you don't have any sin Step right up, and I'm going to let you cast the first stone. And when he stood up and looked around, it was a ghost town. Nobody was standing there but her. And he looked at her, and he said, Woman, where are your accusers? Doesn't anybody bring a charge against you? And she said, she said, No one, Lord. And he said, Well, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Now, did Jesus tell her the truth? Yeah, he said, I'm saying to you that what you've done is a sin, but before he tells her the truth, he, he tempers the truth with what? With, with grace. He, he's, he's kind to her. He's gentle with her. 
He deals with the truth. He said, it is the truth that this is not right and you're not to do this. So don't, so, so go and don't do it anymore. It's not the right thing. But he tempered it with the fact that he was loving and kind and gracious. And so it is the grace of God that makes truth bearable because the fact is straightforward truth would destroy us. We can't handle straightforward truth. It's like Jack Nicholson said in A Few Good Men. <laughs> truth, you can't handle the truth. Well, that's absolutely true. The truth is too rough. It would destroy us. It would, it would, it would shatter our life. So the first thing God does in us is he's going to tell us the truth, but he's going he's to soften it with the anesthesia of some kindness and, and some grace in life. This might, this might be a shock to you. I know that you don't really keep up with a lot of trends of what's going on in life, but there's a trend that's going on in, uh, in relationship life. There was a survey done in 2019, and here's what they said. They said that, um, that kindness in a mate was more important than any points of compatibility. In other words, the fact that the person that you would be interested in in life is kind rather than you have all of these different points that are compatible with each other, that that's the most important thing in a relationship. And they begin to share that with some of these dating sites. Look, you need to change your questionnaires and you need to look for character in people's life more than you do the fact that they were... Uh, that they're, that they're uh, all uh, related, that they have all the same com compatibility traits. I'm just saying to you that in every life, kindness and grace is so important, much more than just that blatant truth because that truth would just kill us. Let me give you, let me give you one more at least. Uh, grace is important and it goes first because it makes the word understandable. Do you know when something is a little bit difficult to look at and translate and figure out, there's always a key to things, right? And a lot of times if you can find the key to something, you can look at it and it'll make sense to you. Well, let me say to this, this to you about the Word of God. The, the key to the Word of God is love. Without love, the Bible is a very dangerous book. Without love, the Bible doesn't make a lot of sense. As a matter of fact, Without love, the Bible has been used to do a lot of really bad stuff around the world. Millions of people have been killed in the name of the Lord by using the Bible as justification for it. All through these years, crusades have been fought by people who said, I'm representing God, and then going and killing half of the, <laughs> the other village or half of the world. I mean, the Bible is a very dangerous book if you don't understand that it's all about love and you don't use the key of love. In Matthew 9, the Pharisees are looking at Jesus and his disciples, and Jesus and his disciples have a great relationship with, with sinners and tax collectors. And the Pharisees are jealous about this relationship that Jesus has with these sinners and these tax collectors. And they, they're questioning the, the disciples about, um, you know, how they, what it is about them that makes these sinners and tax collectors come to them and they won't come to the Pharisees. And, and Jesus says to the Pharisees in Matthew 9, go home and learn what this phrase means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. In other words, he says, I'm not looking for you to give me stuff. I'm looking for you to love people. You ask me what gives us mastery with the people who ought to hate us and ought to be afraid of us? It's because we love them and they receive that love and, and I'm looking for you not to sacrifice to me, not to give me stuff, but that you would love those people. So without love, the Bible is a very dangerous book and when you understand grace, the Bible makes a lot of sense because it's the love of God that he presents and the grace of God. 
Let me give you understanding grace. I know I'm past time, but I want to give it to you. Write it down in your margin or write it down in your, your notes because uh, this is what grace is. I just have a little acrostic for you, G-R-A-C-E. What is grace? Number one, giving away something that is undeserved. The key to this is that you don't deserve it. You and I don't deserve it. When God gives us something good that we don't deserve, that's called grace. If we got what we deserve, what would happen to us? If we, right, if we got what we deserved, then we would die and go to hell. All of us would, because none of us are good enough to deserve to go to heaven when we die. What does the Bible say? The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means every single one of us are sinners. There are none of us that are good enough. Uh, there, there are two things you can do with grace. Number one, you can accept it. Or number two, you can reject it, but you cannot deserve it. Grace has been given to you by God because God is a loving, gracious God who gives us something that we don't deserve. So grace is given to us by God because none of us could be good enough to deserve the grace of God. So when God gives us something good that we don't deserve, that is grace. The R, let me pass on by here. The R is redemptive love. Redemptive love just simply means that, that, Let me just give you the definition. Righteous, purposeful suffering for the sake of another person, salvation or redemption. In other words, redemptive love means that while we were in our sins, Jesus died for us. It means that when I was God's enemy, God was loving me. In spite of the fact that I wasn't treating God right, God treated me right. When I was at my worst, God treated me my best. God does not uh, uh, give retribution in kind. In other words, God doesn't treat you like you treat God. God was, when you were at your worst, God was at his best. And when you were mistreating him and, and, and abusing him and criticizing him and you were as running away from God as fast as you could run away from God, God was running toward you. God was, well, I was moving you. And you've heard me say this before, and I really believe it. If God couldn't run faster than me, I'd never been saved. I was running from God so fast because I didn't know God. I didn't understand God. I, I, I thought God was out to get me. I, I looked at God as an ogre in heaven, but God was just wanting my best. That's redemptive love. So it's giving us something we don't deserve. It's, it's loving us in spite of ourselves and not judging us because of what we are. These are just some passages that deal with that. Here's the A. Accepting and befriending people who are unlike us, reject us, or are unkind to us. This is just simply saying that, that grace is a safe place. Jesus is a safe place. Jesus is not going to take advantage of us. Jesus is not going to hold our, uh, our weaknesses. Again, in, in, or, in other words, it, in order for someone to bless your life, you have to be able to trust them when you are at your most vulnerable. And this just simply, the grace of God just simply says that you can trust Jesus not to take advantage of you, no matter where you are, even in your weakest place. I'm going to read this passage of Scripture. This is out of Luke 6. And, uh, and, I, and I want to, let's see here. Let me see. Here we go. There we go. Beloved, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him, and he will declare justice to the nations. He will not fight or shout or raise his voice in public. He will not crush the weakest reed or put out a flickering candle. Finally, he will call justice. He will cause justice to be victorious, and his name will be the hope of all the world. Then one was brought to him who was demon-possessed, blind and mute, and he healed him so that the blind and the mute man both spoke and saw. In other words, what that verse is saying is that Jesus is so gentle that he would not, in his hands, a flickering candle is safe. 
a candle that's barely burning, he's so gentle that he's not even going to put out a flickering candle. And a reed that's almost broken in two, that's so damaged in this, just that, that in the hand of Jesus, a broken reed is safe. In other words, Jesus is so kind and Jesus is so gentle that he is a safe atmosphere for people who are hurting because people who are hurting need to be in an atmosphere where they won't be judged and they won't be criticized. And Jesus said, that's what my grace is all about. And let me give you the E. The E is extending forgiveness and seeking peace and reconciliation, whether it's deserved or not. Let me read this passage. Judge, therefore, be merciful just as your father's merciful. Okay, so there's the command, be like dad. Judge not, and you should not be judged. All right, and I want you to see the, the I want you to see the context now of this, so you'll know I'm not trying to stretch something and tell you something that's not right. All right, here's the context. Look at look at what he's talking about. All right, all right. He's talking. He says, "Judge." Not. He's talking about therefore be merciful, just as your father's merciful. So he's talking to us about being merciful, right? So this is starting off to be about mercy and about being merciful. Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. So it's talking about it's talking about being merciful. It's talking about not judging people, right? It's talking about not being condemning to people. That's the context of what's going on. Forgive, and you'll be forgiven. So it's talking about how to get forgiveness. So the context of this passage is what he's going to tell us, what he's going to say next, is about the context, which is forgiveness and not being condemned and not being judged and being merciful, right? So look at what he says now in that context. He says, give, verse 38, forgive and it will be forgiven. Next verse, give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over will be put into your bosom for with the same measure that you used, it will be measured back to you. So in the context of mercy and forgiveness and, and condemnation and judgmentalism and all of that, what is that saying? That is saying that Jesus will give you as much mercy and grace as you give, as you can give out. In other words, the way you treat people, the way you judge people, the way you condemn people, the way you, uh, your forg forgiveness works, that God's going to use the same measure to give back to you that you give to give out to them. And I talked about that last week, so I won't go through that. But that's, a, that's an amazing thing. Our God is a God of grace, and he relates to us without merit. And he says to us, you, I, that's the kind of people that I want you to be. That's the kind of people that I created you. As I'm merciful, I want you to be merciful. And that's what God expects from us, and that's what God says we are to be about. And we live in a world now that's very hateful with lots of really bad stuff going on. And if there was ever a time in, hit in the history of the world when people need to see love and grace, it's today. We are called Christians. You know what the word Christian means? Little Christ. We are called Christian. We are called little Christ, which means we are a representative of Christ. And I know this is something you've probably heard a hundred times, and it may sound a little bit corny, but it is the absolute truth. To some people, you are going to be the only Jesus that they see. And you're going to represent Jesus to them. And the way you act is the way they think Jesus acts and the way you deal with them, they think that's the way Jesus deals with them. And you have a window through which people will see Christ and be evaluated and what they'll think about Jesus. And Jesus said, this is your opportunity to, to, to open the window and let people see my grace and my mercy in life. Because that's what God wants to be known for. If you say, God, what are you all about? What is your greatest virtue? What is your greatest attribute? It would be, it's my grace. That's what I want people to see. Oh, I'm full of truth. Absolutely. 
I, I have some t responsibilities. I have some, some truth and some standards and all of that. But that's not what I want them to see first. I want them to see grace first because that's what my real virtue is about, is about grace. And God's done everything in order that we might all receive the grace of God. Uh, you've heard the old acrostic, grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. You've heard that. That's exactly grace. All right, so why don't you bow your head? Right now?